Aloha. It's May the 25th, 2022. Welcome to American Issues Take One. I'm Tim Apicelli, your host. And today's topic is Biden's firm military support for Taiwan. But before we get to that topic, we, we have to go around the table and we have to discuss, unfortunately, the Rob Elementary School shooting in Uvalde, Texas. Uh, before I do that, I'd like to introduce our guests. Today we have as my co-host, Jay Fidel, our special, special guest, Kimmy Ida Foster, uh, attorney at law. And of course, as always, Cynthia Lee Sinclair. Hey, good morning, everyone. Morning, Tim. Good morning. You know, before I go to you guys, um, I'm going to just throw out a few statistics here. I, I hate to do it, but we've been desensitized to all these shootings and Sometimes it's, it's important to remember what's going on. So between 1999 and 2022 with the, the Robb Elementary shooting here of 21, uh, 19 children and two adults, uh, we've had shootings that have taken the lives of 169 children and educators. And that constitutes 14 mass shootings in, in schools of one type or of another. You know, we started off in 1999 with Columbine, Colorado, 13. And by uh, mid, you know, mid, uh, 2015, we had uh, Pilchuck High School, Parkland, Florida, 17, uh, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School, 17, with Rob Elementary, 21, and the list just keeps on going. And so I'm going to ask Jay, my co-host, you first, uh, your thoughts on where we're at, the, the, the logjam of why nothing gets done. And that seems to be the, the popular refrain, nothing's getting done. Your thoughts, Jay? Mm. Um, I have three thoughts I'd like to share with you, Tim. Um, the first is this book called Betrayal by Ira Shapiro. It's a study of Mitch McConnell, um, and it tells you in no uncertain terms that he is without a conscience uh, and without any care for the country. And uh, for some reason, he has influenced uh, the United States Senate for a long time already not to do anything about this. and a number of other issues that we should be addressing, crisis issues. And it's uh, if you had to lay it on one doorstep, it would be Mitch McConnell. Um, the second point, now that's a very readable book, a worthwhile book, I recommend it. Um, the second point um, I, I want to make is, um, is about the media. You know, in, in the minds of these shooters, as they're, you know, planning and, and um, doing their, their deeds, uh, they're thinking about how they're going to be famous, how they're going to leave a legacy. And um, I, I believe that's true, even though they're about to die, a lot of them, like yesterday. But at the same time, I think part of it is they ideate in their minds this legacy, and the legacy is filled with television. It's filled with news media. Um, you know, giving them the legacy, popularizing them, you know, um, Bonnie and Clyde kind of thing, which is my third point. So I'd say that if the, uh, and Cynthia has made this point in the past, if we just shut them down, if, if we didn't talk about them, like we shouldn't talk about Trump, we would probably reduce the, the level of the wanton violence in schools. Um, the third point, and it goes to Bonnie and Clyde, is a certain strain in the American culture that extols violence. But I'll go further. Uh, there's, and, and people like it. They want it. It's, it's a kind of, you know, this reverse heroism of sorts, uh, folk heroes. But there's another thing, too. In human history, I wish we had a, you know, a, a PhD history. Uh, uh, Kimi, you're not a PhD history person, right? Oh, oh God, okay. no. <laughs> <laughs> if we had a history person right here. Um, and we could ask him this question. The question is, it's really funny how uh, evilness is part of the human experience. There are those that gravitate toward uh, anything you could say, you know, it, evil. That's what it is. It's wicked evil. It's part of the human experience. And this is somehow also part of the human experience. What I can't tell you, and I'll stop right now, what I can't tell you is why it happens so much in this country. I can't tell you that. All I can do is lay it at the, at the feet of Mitch McConnell. All right, thank you, Jay. 
Uh, Kimmy, I'd like to get your thoughts on this topic, um, either about Rob Elementary School or, or any of the shootings that have taken place in Buffalo or wherever. Go ahead. Yeah, um, I, I know we were talking about this before, but I was in fifth or sixth grade when Columbine happened. Um, and it was a shock. We got pulled out of school because they were afraid of copycat shooters. The nation went into mourning. Everyone didn't, you know, how could this possibly happen? 23 years later, there's, I think there's now what, 19 children dead? I think the death toll is still rising. Um, and just the, the hypocrisy and inability of people who say things like, well, there's just nothing we can do. Like, you know, second amendment rights, blah, 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 blah. No, you can absolutely do something about this. We have no gun control. And like we were talking about earlier on the show today, it's like what drives me the most nuts at this exact moment in time is that the Venn diagram of people that were screaming last week about protecting children, protecting the unborn, <laughs> and the diagram, Venn diagram of people that are saying, well, there's nothing we can do. We have to protect gun rights is a circle. <laughs> like that is just driving me absolutely crazy because it's like, I, I saw this thing on the internet today. It was like, well, we should probably thank our elementary school children for their sacrifice of protecting our second amendment rights. And it's like, <laughs> This is disgusting. This is absolutely disgusting that we've gotten here as a country. And I completely agree with you, Jay, that you can lay this in Mitch McConnell's feet. Even yesterday, his whole response was, oh, our thoughts and prayers are with the family. Nothing about gun reform, nothing about taking, you know, reducing contributions to NRA, nothing about that. And it's like, this is just going to keep happening because all you want is the money in re-election. And it's, it's, ugh. All right. Thank you. You know, I just want to, go to the term that we often use, and that is the word gun control. You know, so many things are important because they become ingrained in our definition. And once something's defined, that's how we start mm -hmm. to treat it. And the word gun control is maybe a term that we ought to change because control means, oh, you're gonna take away my guns. You're con controlling right. my right to ownership of guns. Right. So maybe it's time for new semantics and new definitions to get away mm -hmm. from uh, the, the 40, you know, 30 year uh, debate or an argument about gun control. So we'll see. Mm -hmm. uh, Cynthia, I'd like to go to you for your, your thoughts on what's occurred here and um, get your perspective, please. My heart is broken because there's no excuse. And I disagree with Jay in the sense that um, um, Mitch McConnell isn't the only one. I've got a list right here. Mitt Romney, huh. these are all GOP senators I'm gonna list here. From the NRA got 13,647,676 dollars from the NRA. Richard Burr in North Carolina, 6 million. I'm not gonna give you all the specific numbers afterwards, but almost 7 million. Roy Blunt in Missouri, 4 million. Tom Tillis, 4 million. Cory Gardner, three million. Well, that's four million too. It's only like two away from four million. Um, Saint Marco Rubio in Florida, three million. Joni Ernst, uh, uh, three million. Rob Portman, three million. And that is not the full list. Okay, that's just the beginning. So after good old Governor Abbott found out that those kids were killed, you know what he did? He went to a fundraiser that night. Of course, now he says, oh, I only stayed a minute. It was just to tell him I wasn't gonna be able to be there. So that could have done with a phone call. And then I watched them sit up there and pat each other on the backs. Every single one of those Republican legislators from Texas, Ted Cruz standing there in the middle, Mr. NRA himself, right? Um, all so that they can uphold a second amendment that was a flawed amendment to begin with back in the what was 1700s was it written um 1780 something i think is when it was written okay and that was to for muskets for mm -hmm. for people to be involved in a militia not mm -hmm. Not your average Joe Blow who has a problem with drugs or whatever, who has a problem with mental illness that isn't being approached to have, be able, this 18 year old walked into a gun store 
and bought a gun on his 18th birthday, which was seven days prior to when he shot everything up. So Texas's great idea on how to stop it. More guns, let's put more guns in the schools. Well, there was an armed officer, resource officer on site that stopped this guy before he went in, but didn't shoot him, didn't pull his gun and say, hey, tell me who you are and what you're, where you're going with that long gun. You know, no, he didn't. So what good is, what good are those? None of that is good. We need to change laws, like Jay says, like, like President Biden said, okay? And then I'm gonna tell you one more and then I'll stop, I'm sorry. But if I get mad, then I won't cry. Otherwise I'll just fall right down crying and I won't be able to get through the rest of the show. Actually two things, sorry. There are talking points that come out of the NRA. And Greg Abbott sat up there and said every single one of them during his little press conference, thoughts and prayers couldn't be presented. Good guy with a gun can stop them. Mental health, when purpose white, it must be white supremacy or, you know, must be mental health at that point. Uh, now, see, too soon to be political. Dem's going to grab guns and that it's a false flag. These are the kinds of things that they are so set on saying. And here we have Representative Randy Fine after President Biden came out and said, when is this going to stop? What are we going to do? We've got to do something. And he says, I have news for the embarrassment that claims to be our president. Try to take our guns and you'll learn why the Second Amendment was written in the first place. Now, if you ask me, that's a threat on our president and the FBI should be knocking on that guy's door. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Cynthia. You know, before we go on to the next topic, just a couple of quick facts. There's over at 2018, there's over 400 million guns in this country. <laughs> um, as far as background checks, 90 percent of Americans think it's appropriate to have background checks. You never see these kind of numbers. And last but not least, Citizens United has done more to fund not only the GOP, but also Democrats as far as supporting no legislation on gun reform. And I won't use the word gun control because we're going to try to get away from that word. All right. I have uh, to add one thing, Tim. Go ahead. Last night there was this thing about, uh, uh, the, I guess it was about China on PBS Hawaii. Um, and it was about China and the, um, the, um, the, uh, um, the pandemic of the uh, World War I time. And uh, there was a sign one woman was carrying in it. She was wearing a mask and it said, wear a mask or go to jail. Wear a mask or go to jail. And, 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 and that tells you the difference between then and now. If you didn't wear a mask, you went to jail. Now, if you don't you know, wear a mask, nothing happens. And if you, you know, the other guy and complain about it, well, you get beat up or what. Um, and it reminds me also, I'll stop in a minute, um, Australia, uh, often cited as a, a successful gun reform country. Mm -hmm. um, and what they did was they said, look, we'll buy your guns back and we'll pay you fair value for the guns. Uh, and if you don't sell it back, you go to jail. It's, it's a choice. Um, and, and, and I think it's time to return to that in the sense that um, there's a place to enforce laws. We should make them, but we also have to enforce them. And, and we're going to get all this talk uh, about gun control now, and it'll, it'll peter out in a week, and then we'll be nowhere. We have to do more than that. Can I right. say one more statistic that I have? Yes. <clears throat> and that is that there were 288 school shootings in the United States since 2009. Canada had two. France had two. Germany had one. Japan, zero. Italy, zero. UK, zero. That's what we're against. That's, that's well, what we're Glaring against. numbers, Cynthia. Definitely glaring statistics. No two ways about it. Okay, we are going to switch. We're going to switch here, and we're going to go to the topic of uh, the recent uh, President Biden's comment uh, in Tokyo regarding his support or the United States' support for Taiwan. And if you remember, President Biden is not your typical politician. He, he, doesn't, he doesn't mince words sometimes. 
He actually is very clear, black and white. And that's very unusual for a politician, particularly a president of the United States. But if you remember, he was black and white when he said that uh, Putin was involved with war crimes in Ukraine. He was black and white when he said there was genocide that's being committed in Ukraine. And uh, this week, he was not strategically ambiguous. He was clear as could be is that there is going to be military support for Taiwan should China aggressively um, approach and attack Taiwan. So, Jay, to you, are you are you surprised that Joe Biden was actually this explicit? He also was on CNN uh, town meeting months ago and, and basically said the same thing about an explicit uh, support for Taiwan on a military basis. Uh, and then, of course, they try to walk that back. And I think they try to walk back a little bit what happened this week. Your thoughts? You know, I the people around him are going to try to walk those things back, but I admire him for saying them. Uh, you've made a pretty good case uh, uh, that he does speak truth to power. Um, he does say what's on his mind, and what's on his mind is, is correct. Um, so I don't, I don't fault him. Uh, I wish they wouldn't try to walk him back all the time. Um, and, uh, you know, in dealing with um, Putin, you've got you've to gotta be strong. And uh, uh, in dealing with uh, Xi Jinping, you've got to be strong. And we all know that Xi Jinping is watching Putin. Um, and, and he's learning from what's going on and how we react uh, in Ukraine. And if we're soft in Ukraine, um, he's going to take that as a signal uh, that would be soft in Taiwan. Um, so I think it's a it's a it's a poker game, uh, a very sophisticated poker game. You have to understand your adversary. I suppose if you analyze uh, Xi Jinping over and over for months and years, and you know you over overthink it, you probably um, would be very reserved, just as we were very reserved at the outset about the MIGs in Ukraine. Um, but actually, it probably has a good effect. What it's saying is. At least we have a president who will make these statements. Uh, at least we have a president who would consider the possibility of um, of heightening the of heightening the uh, aggression, um, you know, the response. Um, and w whether we do it or not is another question. That's going to be, you know, uh, that's going to be circulated among many think tanks and and many government officials before we do anything. But at least the possibility exists. And I think we've got we've got to uh, you know make that point with Xi Jinping. So all in all, I think it's good, it's right, uh, and I appreciate him saying it, and I appreciate him saying it vis-a-vis -vis Putin. Okay, uh, Kimmy, uh, you know Jay just mentioned think tanks that um, the president, no doubt, is taking some information from one way or the other, and the question well, is still ambiguous: is that when the United States says it's going to back up Taiwan? on a military basis. The question is, does that take the form of what we're doing in Ukraine? And that is no direct boots on the ground, no naval blockades, no air you know, zone protection, mm -hmm. but we're mm -hmm. supplying uh, sanctions and we're supplying weapons. Uh, do you think when it comes to Taiwan, we take the Ukraine approach or do you think we directly get involved with boots on the ground or, or naval blockades or um, protection of the airspace for Taiwan? I think I suspect it's probably going to be the latter if push comes to shove, um, if China actually invades or starts making military aggressions. I want to say at the outset, I think uh, important in answering your question is that I understand the impulse and I do it too to compare the situation in Ukraine and the situation in Taiwan. But I think at the end of the day, it's kind of a flawed analysis because they're two very, very different geopolitical sections, very, very different geopolitical relationships with the United States. Um, the U.S.'s relations with Ukraine are kind of more recent, very informal. Um, you know, they're not part of NATO, all of those things. The U.S. relations with Taiwan go back a much longer time. I think the Taiwan Relations Act is what, 1978, 79, something like that, um, which, you know, a lot of people have cited to where you're just reinforcing your commitment. I also think that it's because it's I, I hate to say this and it sounds cold, but it's a priority issue, too. Um, Russia invading Ukraine, it's awful, it's war crimes, it's anti-humane, but Russia is, I think, on the sunset. China has been on the rise for a very, very long time. Um, 
and also just kind of our economic interests in, in Ukraine and Taiwan, those are very, very, very different. Um, you know, in Ukraine, I, I don't know that much about what their industrial complex is, but I know it's nowhere near as significant as what we're going out of Taiwan. Microchip production, um, inductor, you know, technology, all of those things. So if push came to shove, I think our response would be significantly stronger because we have one, a history of it, two more vested interests, and three, just a stronger relationship with them. And that's kind of the differences I see. Let me follow up by asking, you know, in, in NATO, the United States said, hey, if we plant our troops in Germany, in all these NATO countries, then an attack on one is an attack on all. But more importantly, mm -hmm. that United, you know, U.S. soldiers are being attacked. So would it be wise for the United States to actually put naval ships off the shores of Taiwan? Or like in Korea, South Korea, and like in Germany, uh, we put troops actually on the soil of Taiwan, Taiwan so that if there is a, an aggressive attack by China, it really is an attack on U.S. soldiers. Would that be a deterrent? And do you think Taiwan would ever allow us to put boots on their soil? I think it would definitely be a deterrent, um, especially because I think China is a much more sophisticated analyst, and I think they play the long game. I think they recognize things that Putin does not necessarily. Um, whether Taiwan would allow it, I really don't know because I mean, Taiwan wants our support, but Taiwan also wants sovereignty and independence and to recognize that it can stand on its own two feet. And there's also the issue that God bless the US military, but we have never ever gone into somewhere and then left. That's just not our thing. <laughs> you know, we, we go there, we stay, we make home. Like that's uh, what don't, we do. don't forget Afghanistan, Kimi. <laughs> no, like, you're right. Um, oh, unless we leave it in complete sorry. shambles. <laughs> Those are your two options. Yeah. Um, so I think that Taiwan would definitely be faced with kind of a controversy of like, okay, we're trying to be this sovereign nation, but we could really use some support in the back end, at least initially. You know, so I don't know what's going to happen there, but it's going to be a push and pull they're going to have to address at some point. Okay, that's fair. Cynthia, you know, um, Sometimes I, I don't like to say our government is naive, but sometimes our government is naive. And I, I think it was wishful thinking for the United States to assume or just turn a blind eye to the interaction between China and Hong Kong, that ha China was going to honor their word to let Hong Kong exist as an ec economic um, subset of China and, and not meddle with them. But we now know that's not true. And all, all democracy uh, for Hong Kong is basically vaporized. Are we, are we also going to be naive when it comes to China and Taiwan? If China starts saying, you know, we will treat Taiwan as a independence, but yet a sovereign nation of China, but independently run, uh, should we fall into that trap as we did with Hong Kong? Well, we is a big term. I myself am not. A, <laughs> they, a, I use they. <laughs> the powers that be, and I don't know if necessarily they're naive, is they, they make their choices, um, you know, they independently make their informed choices. So um, I don't know. Um, I, I don't trust China. I don't think anybody should trust China. I don't think China is as they do play the long game, but you know, we think about and we talk about the misinformation that comes out of Russia. China is like the, the, the I don't know, the originator of disinformation and misinformation. The very first, and the, I think a good example, the very first Olympics that took part in China, um, or took place in China, they made it scrubbed all nice and pretty and shiny and everything looked beautiful and all these happy people dressed in all these beautiful colors. And, and then you go about 20 miles outside of the city and it's squalor for as far as you can see. People living in cardboard huts, freezing to death, you know, working their fingers to the bone. They get nothing from the state. All of those things. So China has established itself right then and there. And that's, I don't know as it's naive as it's blinded by the truth of who China is. And that's who China is. They're gonna present something to the world, but then, you know, what is the, the iPhone city in China where all those people, they had to put up nets 
around the buildings because the work conditions were so horrible that they were launching themselves off the roof to commit suicide. That's who China is. So we got to remember who China is. And in dealing with Taiwan, we also have to remember that China has just as many nukes as Russia. So if we didn't mm -hmm. like stand up personally to Putin because we were afraid of nukes, the same thing applies here. Now, giving them weapons to help support themselves, I am completely behind. But putting boots on the ground, I'm not behind at all. But that's just me. And I don't okay. want the government. That's fair enough. Uh, we're almost out of time, but I want to go, uh, Kimmy, I want to go back to you for something here. Sure. Um, you know, Taiwan is one of the leading manufacturers of computer chips. And mm -hmm. so the question is, is China's interest pertaining to that industry? Or is this just a political um, agenda that China has to say that, you know, we are still a communist nation, although we resemble a lot of capitalism, but we're communist and we want Taiwan to... Um, you know, get in line with that concept. Do you think it's economic or political or both? I think it's both. Um, I think China has long had grand ambitions of kind of reunifying what they see as their empire. Um, and also I think China has done, it, China, like you just, I think kind of alluded to, it's a bizarre situation, right? Where they're trying to run a pseudo capitalist economy in a communist society. They don't work. They are diametrically opposed. Um, so I think it's both. I think it's all of it. I think they want the land that they think is owed to them. They want the economic benefit that comes with it. And they also want, I mean, at the end of the day, they want the respect of the rest of the country, the rest of the world. You know, they want to be part of Pax Asiana, the rise of this whole, this whole area. Um, and I know we're running out of time, so I think you're probably going to circle back to Cynthia Leaf one more time. <laughs> well, w eventually. <laughs> um, last question on this topic, Jay, you get it. Um, what are the top maybe the top two or three strategies, the United States and or in its cooperation with uh, Japan and Australia and uh, South Korea and India, what, what top strategies could be implemented to dissuade China from further aggression, certainly flybys into their, you know, their airspace um, to cease and desist those type of activities? Well, first, the first one is at home. You know, if uh, Xi Jinping sees that we're discombobulated, that our government is not effective, uh, that Mitch McConnell isn't doing anything and all that. Um, and, and he's waiting, as just as Putin is waiting, for Trump to come back because yeah. he knows that Trump is a fool when it comes to uh, international mm -hmm. policy, a total fool. Tr Trump mucked up the, the Hong Kong uh, situation to a fairly well. Um, so if he comes back, that, that works in favor of China. China hopes that we don't play the long game, that we you know, change our governments like our underwear. Uh, and that we have different policies every time you look. And that works just perfectly for Xi Jinping, who is you know, likely to be president for life, at least for a long time. Um, so what we have to do first is, is get our house in order domestically uh, and, 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 and play the long game, or at least think about playing the long game. Uh, it's better to, eat, to think about it than not to think about it. Even if we have trouble doing it, let's at least you know, take that position. The second thing is, um, you know, I, I, I think the quad, you know, the quad, uh, that is the sort of the beginnings of a, a, a trade arrangement between four countries and, and building stuff, um, you know, that will compete with, with China is a really good idea. And we should spend a lot of time and money building the quad and more, a kind of NATO of, the, of Southeast Asia. This is ripe. It's time for that. I think those countries will get on board. I think they're all terrified of China and they'll be happy to join us. But again, they have to trust that we'll be around, our administration be around longer than a couple of years. And finally, um, you know, I, I do think that, uh, uh, that Taiwan would have us, not necessarily for, you know, big bases, but any kind of presence. Because in their world, in their list of priorities, the first priority, and talk to any Taiwanese about this, the first priority is maintaining their sovereignty. And it should be. It's like life itself. And the second priority is you know, maybe capitulating to American influence. Um, I, I don't think they distrust us. They're a democracy. We're a democracy. We're not all bad. Um, so I think they would let us, let us go there. But the problem is it would be a sharp stick in China's eye to have troops underground or a base or you know, a presence of any magnitude on Taiwan. Uh, and, and that would be of some concern that it would accelerate, escalate the whole affair. 
but unbalanced, like like Biden. I myself, and you can vote for me for president. I myself would <laughs> do it. Okay, I would do it because I think it's time for the United States to take affirmative action. We have lost so much ground in Asia Pacific by being weenies. It's time for us to do strong and dedicated things. All right, thank you. That concludes our time for this topic. Uh, the term strategically ambiguous always comes to mind as far as our interaction with Taiwan. Okay, uh, Cynthia, your last thoughts and comments for, for this program, uh, either pertaining to the Texas shooting, school shooting, or this topic specifically. Um, we need to go past thoughts and prayers. Every single person out there needs to call their representatives, their state representatives, their, you know, their US representatives, call it, flood their inboxes, flood everything. But, but we have to start with voting rights because until we get voting rights, we're never gonna get rid of any of these crazy Republicans that are able to keep re, I don't know, upping themselves by changing the laws on who gets to count the votes. And so if you wanna make change, you gotta get involved and maybe even do more than just be ready to vote, be ready to really make a stink. Call Washington, call everybody you can think of to call because we gotta stop this. Two, almost 300 school shootings since 2009, as opposed to other countries that have two. There's just, we can't sit by silently you know, sending out thoughts and prayers like all the kids from Marjorie Stone Douglas were saying when they were done. We're done with these thoughts and prayers. We need more than thoughts and prayers. Get, get involved in the programs that the Sandy Hook parents have, that the, um, the kids from Marjorie Stone and Douglas have. Get involved. Just get involved. Good point. Thank you, Cynthia. Uh, Kimmy, your last thoughts, please. I completely agree, Cynthia. Um, you know, I'm so tired of thoughts and prayers and moments of silence and seeing flags at half mass and then having people say, well, nothing we can do about it. Um, and just knowing that, you know, we, the American people, have the ability to change this by voting these guys out. And mm -hmm. these people, like these senators and these, these representatives, need to recognize that they are servants to the people, not to the NRA not to money, not to their seat. Um, and I, I completely agree, you know, call them, push them, tell them we need to get you out of there because you're not protecting the most vulnerable of our population, that's children. Um, and I would love, I, I hope something happens, but I just, I, I'm feeling a little heartbroken and just sad about it today because it's been 23 years and nothing has happened. Thank you, Kimmy, very much. Uh, Jay, you get the last uh, thought and comment. Well, um, there, there's a connection between the two subjects we've been talking about. Um, you know, I, I said that we can't have a, you know, convincing, credible foreign policy dealing with people who would like to upstage us at every turn uh, if we don't have it worked out at home. And uh, clearly, um, you know, the thing in Texas demonstrates and the thing in the Senate demonstrates that we don't have it worked out at home. This should be basic, fundamental you know, respect for people, uh, respect for law and order, for security, uh, to be proud and patriotic of living in this country. And how can you do that? You know, thoughts and prayers, of course, don't do it. We have to take affirmative action. We have to throw the bums out. And the way to do that, I mean, regrettably, the only real way to do that is at the polls. So we are in an inflection time here, not only for, um, you know, school killings and so many other you know, human issues in this country, but for all the policies that we might adopt domestically and, and foreign, and to, to be the country we think we are, that we want to be. And we're a long way from that. And it, this is the year, this is the year where we collectively decide. Okay. I, I missed data. I said, you're going to get the last comment, but I'm going to take the last comment. Um, you know, we are not going to get an assault ban in the Senate. It's, it's a fool's mission to try. 
but we mm-hmm. can get a, a red flag, a national red flag bill passed. We can get a background check passed. The nation supports it by 90%. Even a lot of GOP support red flag uh, legislation. It's something that's obtainable and the time is now. So with that, I'd like to conclude. I'd like to thank our special guest, Kimmy uh, Ida Foster. Ide, make it Ide. Ide, excuse me, my, my, my apologies. <laughs> Kimmy Ide Foster, Cynthia Lee Sinclair, and Jay Fidel, my co-host. Thank you for joining us on American Issues Take One. Won't you please join us next Wednesday at 11 o'clock. And until then, I'm Tim Apicelli, your host, and we'll see you later. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.